We're reading from the Old Testament book of Job this morning, Um, a fairly long reading. Let's hear God's word, Job 1, beginning at verse 1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and he had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. Now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then. Everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job, saying, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The professor stood at the front of the class and asked us if we knew what the meaning of existential was. Now, I had just transferred from the School of Architecture at Carleton University into the religion department. It had been two years uh, and high school since I had written an essay, and I wasn't very good at it then. I used the word conceptual a lot in architecture, but existential was not one I don't think I'd even heard before. 
existential, what had I gotten myself into? Thankfully, I wasn't the only one who had either a blank or frightened look on his face. So Professor Osborne said, think of it in these terms. You check into a hotel room, you get into the room, do you look at the little map on the back of the door that shows where the emergency exits are? This is an actual question that I'm looking for answers. How many of you, when you go into a hotel motel inn, look at the little map on the back of the door to see where the exits are? Four, five, six. Now, do you really look at the map to see where the exits are, or are you looking to see what checkout time is? Because um, sometimes that's there too. We, we tend not to pay a lot of attention to it. We might glance at it, but it tends not to mean too much to us. Unless you hear the fire alarm and you smell smoke, then that little map becomes existential to you. That is, it matters to the very depth of your being. It matters to your existence. Grace was out with the youth group one Friday evening many years ago when our first child was about 18 months. Um, Kurt had a bad cold, so I went up and checked on him every once in a while, but I was watching TV in our TV room. And as I was watching, we had the old-fashioned baby monitor. It was just audio. There was no video. And a sound came out of the baby monitor. And it's the kind of sound that makes a parent's blood run cold. And I went running up the stairs because I thought he was choking. Got into the room and discovered he wasn't choking. He was having a seizure. Had no idea why this is happening. So I grabbed hold of him and ran down the stairs, preparing to get to the hospital. And as I was going down the stairs, I had a fairly intense existential conversation with God. Because it mattered to the core of my being. Now, it turned out to be not a problem. It was a febrile convulsion. His fever had spiked, and that happens with small children sometimes, horrifying as it is. But nobody could have convinced me it wasn't a problem as I was coming down those stairs. Do you have existential questions? Of course you do. We all do. They may not always be in the front of our mind, but they are always there. And in this past week, with the increasing tensions between the U.S. and Iran, and then the downing of the plane in which so many Canadians died and so many others, and then the discovery that it was shot down, we have existential questions. Why? 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 Today we're beginning a study that will take us through the book of Job. Job contains existential questions. The book of Job is about suffering. And so our primary existential question is why is there suffering? And that question gets asked in a variety of different ways from different perspectives. Why do the good suffer? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why don't the evil seem to suffer the same way as the good? Is God angry with me? Why does God allow suffering in his creation? Why does allow God allow his people to suffer? All of these questions are full of deep meaning because they have real impact on our lives and our understanding of our lives and our place in the world, our place in relationship to God. So we begin to look at the book of Job expecting that we will find an answer to the question of why suffering exists. 
or at least why we suffer. But then, as we begin to read, we discover that God has another question, another existential question, and God addresses that question, and Job has to answer it. Now, there's some debate over what the name Job means. Names in the Bible, the meaning of names is really important. Well, Job can mean where is the divine father, but Job can also mean persecuted one. So right at the start, we see that not only is the book of Job full of existential questions, it's full of irony as well. We read that Job lived in the land of Uz. We don't know where that is. There's speculation as to where it could be. It probably, for the telling of the story, meant something about like a long time ago in a far, far away kind of place. The book doesn't fall into the particular history of God's people, but it is a story of God's people because it uses the name of God, Yahweh, the name that God shared with Moses and with his people and shared only with his people. Now, I've heard a number of sermons on the book of Job from other preachers, and usually it covers the whole book in one sermon. And I get that because the structure of the book of Job has has the story, the narrative in the first two chapters and the last half of chapter 42. That's the story. Everything else in between is poetic monologue and dialogue all the way through. But today, we start at the beginning. We start with the narrative, the story. And we find that even in those first two chapters, that same pattern is repeated where there is narrative and dialogue and narrative again. We find that Job was a good man. He was blameless and upright. Job was a man who revered God and shunned evil. He had authentic faith and genuine morality. Job was also very wealthy. He had many children. He had huge flocks of animals. Job had it all, and he was a faithful follower of God. And then the first dialogue happens in the story. And... God is there in heaven, and his angels gather around, and the Satan is also there. Now, later in biblical theology, the Satan, a title, became a proper name, the name that was given to the evil one, Satan. But in the book of Job, it's really more offered as a title than it is a name, even though many translations translate it as a proper name. The Satan means the adversary or the accuser. So throughout, I'm going to refer to the Satan and not Satan. Now, we must, must, must take note of something because there are those who look at the book of Job and see it as a book about dualism, good against evil, Two champions, God and the Satan. Who's going to win? The book of Job is not about dualism. There is no mistaking that God and the Satan are in no way, shape, or form equal at all. God is Lord of all. And the only authority that the Satan has is given to him by God. That's significant for us. God is in charge. God wins. There's no question about that. We come to the dialogue in the first dialogue in the story. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not 
put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has. You have blessed the work of his hand so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power. This is God giving authority. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. We have here what appears to be a bizarre interaction between God and Satan. But we need to set aside all the images of devils and pitchforks that we have in our minds. The Satan here is the accuser of humanity before God. It's like that's what his job is, is to accuse humanity before God, to convince God that the people of the world are worthless and of no value. And the Satan asks the question, is Job faithful just because you've given him so much? You've given him everything. You've protected him so well. No wonder he's faithful to you. You see, the existential question being asked here is not about suffering, but about why Job is faithful to God. And that's a question that matters to the core of his being. It's an existential question. Is Job's faithfulness really and merely a response to God's goodness to him? Is God worthy of worship only because of what he does for us, or is God worthy of worship because of who he is? And that's the crux of this. The question is asked, and Job must answer, is Job faithful only because God had given him so much? And the Satan is given authority to take from Job but not to harm him. We read of the four calamities in which everything was taken from Job, his wealth and even his children. In shock and in grief, Job tears his clothes and shaves his head as physical signs of his grief and loss. And then he threw himself to the ground and said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Can you imagine saying that after what Job had just been through? I struggle with imagining that coming from myself. But what a profound thing for Job to say. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In the pain of his loss, Job acknowledged God as God and the giver of all things. To Job, you see, God wasn't just a convenience to be called upon when he wanted something. To Job, God is God. And Job was faithful because God is God and not because God was a convenience for him. The dialogue returns to heaven in chapter 2, which we didn't read, where God is pointing out that the Satan was wrong, that Job maintained his faith even in the face of losing everything. So the Satan presses the point and saying, well, yeah, he he remained faithful in losing everything, but if you strike down his good health, then he's going to curse you to your face. And so once again, 
the Lord allowed the Satan the authority this time to harm but not to kill. And the Satan afflicted Job with terrible sores from head to foot, so painful that it seemed best to Job to try and scrape them off with a piece of broken pottery. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the depths of Job's emotional and physical pain? Yes, some people in this church can. Perhaps some sitting in this room, even right now. Maybe not the full depths of what Job experienced, but a lot like what Job experienced. Then Job's wife comes to him and says, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Did Job's wife speak out of unfaithfulness or did she speak out of pain? She lost everything as well. And now her husband was in deep, deep physical pain. We don't know her intentions. All we know is what Job said in response. He said, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Now, some argue that this second affirmation wasn't as strong as the first, and, and I suppose that could be argued. But given the circumstances, uh, it continues to be a shining example of faith in the face of the worst that life can throw at us. And others might argue that this is not a realistic response at all after what Job had been through the loss of everything he owned, the loss of his family, the bulk of his family, and now to be in deep physical pain. This is not a, a realistic human response, and people can argue that. And yet I know people, and you probably know people, Christians who have been through horrendous suffering who have been through things that I can barely begin to imagine, and they come through with faith not only intact, but frequently faith that has grown. So here, after the introduction to the story of Job, we find that we're no closer to the answer of why there is suffering. What do we know after these two chapters, other than that there's no easy answer to suffering? What we do know from Job and from life is that bad things happen. Suffering happens. Life can be not only bad at times, but life can be really ugly at times. And that's not news to us, or at least it shouldn't be. But sometimes we need to be reminded that suffering is not an unusual thing in life. It is a part of our existence, and it is a part of life. It is a part of our lives. We also see in these chapters that suffering happens with God's permission. Of course, that draws us immediately back to our existential question, doesn't it? Why does God allow his people to suffer? And that question is going to remain with us over the next few weeks as we continue to wrestle with this. So what do we discover in this passage other than that there is no easy answer to the question of suffering? We learn some important things from Job's faith. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Job teaches us that God is not just a convenience there for us 
to provide what we want when we want it. But do we not look at God that way sometimes? Do we not want God to give us the things we ask for when we pray? Of course we do. Do we not want God to smooth out the rough places and the rough parts of our lives? Of course we do. Do we not expect or at least hope that God will make life a little easier if we do all of this faith stuff for him? Of course, that's always floating around in our heads. If God did exist for our convenience, then it would make sense for us to abandon him when things don't go the way we want. But God does not exist for our convenience. God loves us, obviously to the core of who he is, but he is still God. God is God. Yahweh is Lord. God is creator of all that exists. And in Jesus Christ, God is our Savior. And that is something we need also to be reminded of again and again, especially when we don't get what we want. That God is God, and he is Lord, and he is holy, and he loves us but he is God. Do you look at God as something that exists simply for your convenience? To be accepted and rejected according to what he's done for you lately? The answer to the first existential question in Job, why does Job have faith in God, is because God is God. Sounds kind of obvious. That God is Lord of all and that he is worthy of our worship and deserves our devotion no matter what he's done for us lately. And I want you to wrestle with those questions this week. A little bit of homework to wrestle with those questions. Who is God? And what does that mean for me, for you? And why is God worthy of your devotion? If you decide he is worthy, why is he worthy? Well, maybe you need to answer that question before you can decide if he is worthy. Because in the depths of of Job's despair and all that he had gone through. He proclaimed that the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Let's pray together. Our God, we thank you for life. And we know and acknowledge that life has some real ups and downs and some times of true despair. But we thank you that you are with us always, that you have promised never to leave us or forsake us. And that is true when life is good, that is true when life is bad, and that is true when life is just ugly. We thank you for examples of faith that we see for those in the Bible like Job and Moses and David and Paul and Peter. We thank you uh, not only for the example of faith of Jesus, but we thank you that Jesus, the very Son of God, also suffered. He knew tremendous emotional and physical suffering and even died for us. And we thank you that in and through him, you give us life, full, whole, good life. Even in the struggles, even when it's bad, even when it's ugly. Lord, we pray your grace upon this world. We, we 
continue to pray for the people of Australia and the fires that are there. We pray, Lord, for weather that would put those fires out. And we pray for all those who suffered loss because of the plane crash in Iran. Lord, in and through that, we pray for your truth and your peace and your justice. And Lord, in our city, we pray for our neighbors. We pray your grace upon those who live in the neighborhoods around St. Paul's. We pray that the people of this area would know you and know your grace. And Lord, we pray for St. Paul's. We pray for us as a church. And this morning, we pray particularly for Ben Campbell, Clive and Terry's son. We pray, Lord, that you would bless him and be with him uh, tomorrow and in these days that are come in the struggle in which he is experiencing. We pray your blessing upon Clive and Terry uh, to support him and to uphold him. Lord, we offer all of these prayers in and through the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.